Good morning, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's another day's journey, and I'm so thankful to be here. Just got off the freeway coming from San Diego with the weekend, and we had a wonderful time this weekend. We connected with God in a special way, the sisters and the brethren. Um, and we're just really grateful for what God is doing in the body of Christ. And I hope that you too are grateful and I hope and pray that you too are experiencing things in life that would make a difference in your life. And I'm just glad to be here to share a word of God with anyone who tunes in, anyone that tunes in later, anyone that is thirsty for God. I am excited about being able to share this word with God. So we're going to get started in just a moment. If any of you are sick this morning, I want to encourage you that the healer is here and he's ready to touch you. He's ready to allow you to touch the hem of his garment. He's ready for you to connect with him. He's ready to show you that he is God, Jehovah Jireh, who provides for his people. If any of you are confused or worried or frustrated or feeling a little unnecessary or displaced. I want you to know that the healer, the mover, the shaker, the one who loves you, the one who gave his life for you is here right now to restore you, to give you confidence, to comfort you, to encourage you. If you are feeling like you're not going to make it the rest of this day or tomorrow, I want you to know that God Almighty himself is here and he's ready to restore you. He's ready to lift you up with his righteous right hand. He's ready to hold you in his arms. He's ready to rock you in the cradle of his arms. He's ready. My question for you, are you ready? What's going to change? What's going to turn things around for you that you will trust God with everything in your life? So we are here today ready to worship him by hearing his word being taught this morning. So God, Father God, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise, Lord. We thank you for another day's journey. We thank you for another opportunity. We thank you for keeping us when we couldn't keep ourselves. We thank you, thank you for healing us when the doctors and medication could not heal us, God. We thank you, God, that the blood is running warm in our veins, God. That means we have another opportunity to draw near to you so you can draw near to us. We have another opportunity to glorify you. We have another opportunity to say, for God I'll live and for God I'll die and mean it. So God, touch your people today, including me. Touch us from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. Let your anointing flow, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up. Fill us up till we overflow. In Jesus' name we pray and the church said, Amen. Amen. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians today, chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Our subject matter, our sermon title, whatever you want to call it, is a temple for the Lord. A temple for the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. And the word reads, now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation, an habitation of God through the Holy Spirit. Now, Apostle Paul wrote the book of Ephesians to the church of Ephesus. <clears throat> and the Apostle Paul wrote this book to this church to encourage the believers. And he wanted to encourage, as a matter of fact, the entire church. And that's what we as teachers and preachers, we do when we're teaching Sunday school or having one-on-ones or group sessions or preaching the word on Sunday morning. Our job is to encourage you to stay strong and to encourage you to hold on and keep 
your faith in the Almighty. Paul's writings in this book are very clear, very clear. They are concise, they're encouraging because they provide a direct explanation of the nature and the purpose of God's church. Paul wants the church to realize we are not a brick and mortar building. And some of us continue to think that church is about being inside of a building. But Paul is defining throughout the book of Ephesians, that is not where the church is. That's a building that houses the Christians and the body of Christ that come together to worship, to go back out and share what they received from the Holy Spirit. It's not a hangout place. It's where believers just go to meet up. It's not a place for us just to go and meet up, I should say. It's not a have fun place. It's not a tell jokes place. It's not an hour or two of socialization when we come together in worship. We come to dedicate ourselves to Christ, to worship him, to praise him, and to give him our all in all. No church, no, no, the church is not you or, or this one or that one. It's the body of Christ collectively together, better known uh, as the body of Christ. So the body of Christ, that means you and me and all of us who believe in Jesus Christ, who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, who have united with churches or buildings and edifices that have names on top of them or outside of them, we are still the body of Christ, not the building, but the people. And it is our responsibility, church, it's our responsibility to live, breathe, think, and mirror the life of Christ because we are the body of Christ. In other words, what I'm saying is we must act like Christ because you are the temple of the Lord. I am the temple of the Lord and the temple of the Lord can't act out of character because then it is not the temple of the Lord. You have been changed. You are no longer living on your own with no purpose. You're no longer living without an everlasting home. You're no longer wandering in life fruitlessly and aimlessly. Why? Because you are a part of the body of Christ. You are the temple. So our message this morning is to share that this God that we talk about every week, this God that we read about, this God that we shout to, this God that we praise, this God that has healed the sick and raised some from the dead, uh, even in our society, this God, this God who sent his son to die for us, this message this morning is to talk about this God and this God whom we know and love is in the people changing business. This God whom we know and love is God, the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord and Lord. And God is always, always, church, at work, transforming people, transforming nations. But the people and the nations must accept the free gift and the free offer of salvation. And once it's accepted, then that's where we have to live into it, breathe into it, become Christ-like by any means necessary. We have to be as bold as Satan and as powerful as the anointing God died for us to have. So let's look at what salvation means. And it doesn't mean, I don't think you know, it's always good to make sure everyone knows and it's always good to put out a refresher. Salvation means we receive God's grace and we receive his mercy. And you receive that every day. We received it this morning when he allowed us to get up. Salvation means we receive God's deliverance and God's redemption. Deliverance and redemption is the saving of human beings from sin and sin's consequences. So you know that when you sin, there are consequences that come behind sin. And if you are fortunate enough to not have to pay the consequences of your sin act, then you should charge that to God's grace and mercy upon you. Because when we're out here in the in the world and, and there are laws for the land of the world and you run a stop sign or a red light or whatever it is out there and the police happen to see it and stop you, you may not... Um, you will get a ticket. You will pay a price 
for breaking the law, for being disobedient. There are consequences in every avenue of life for us to pay, whether you are a believer or not. The consequ consequences include death and they include separation from God. The consequences mean death, and it doesn't always mean physical death. Death in your, your liveliness, death in your hope, death in your joy, death in your peace. And it brings about separation from, from God because God does not uh, uh, condone or allow his people to be sinners and serve him in the same breath. There's a price to pay for the consequences of being disobedient to the word of God. Sin consists of our actions, our thoughts, uh, the way we think, the way we act, the immortality and selfishness. So in other words, what I'm saying, sin is anything that alienates you and I from God. And that right there means we have to do some soul searching. What is alienating me from God? What is keeping me from obeying God? What is keeping me from following God, studying his word, showing up for, for Bible study, showing up for prayer? You show up for God like he shows up for you and then we're going to be doing something. So this offer that God has given every man, woman, boy, and girl, this offer to receive the gift of salvation will not be on the table forever, church. That offer will not be on the table forever. There will come a time when we will not be able to find God. Isaiah 55, 6. There is a time coming where you won't be able to pray where he's going to hear you. There's a time coming where you won't be able to confess your sins. There is a time coming when the clock stops ticking and it's time for the Lord and, our Lord and Savior to return in that second coming. The offer of, of, of the gift of salvation will not remain on the table forever. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is yet near. Isaiah 55. Well, uh, I hear you saying nothing in life is free. I'm talking about this free gift of salvation. And I know you think, or some of us may think, that nothing in life is free. But that's not true. That's not true. Let's rephrase it by saying nothing in this world is free. The world wants us to pay for everything. The Christian man and woman are in this world, but we are no longer of this world. We are new creatures in Christ. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. We are now following Christ. We are kingdom children and we live here on earth in the kingdom of God. Upon confessing their faith in Christ Jesus, the Bible tells us in this passage of scripture, and Paul tells us throughout, and Jesus speaks it, and, and the word speaks it, and other witnesses speak it, Gentiles are no longer strangers. That means you and I, we're not Jewish, but we are Gentiles, and God has opened up the gift of salvation for Gentiles to accept him and come into his king and kingdom and dwell with him, represent him. We are no longer strangers and for foreigners, Gentiles. They have a home now. We have a home now where the Father loves us unconditionally. Now, on this retreat we were on this weekend, we, we, we talked about a young lady, not about her, but with her, that uh, she doesn't feel love. She feels useless. She feels that there is nothing there for her whatsoever. But I came to tell you this morning that you as a Gentile, you have a home where your father loves you unconditionally. But you will not know if you are loved if you refuse to get to know Jesus. You will not know if you are loved if you refuse to draw near to him so he can draw near to you. You will not know that you are loved if you will not read the Bible and study the Bible and ask questions about the Bible. You will not know that you are loved if you don't teach yourself how to pray to an all-righteous, almighty God. You are a Gentile, you're no longer a stranger, you're no longer a foreigner, 
That means you have a father that is providing for you. And his name is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah is the God who will meet all of your need according to his riches and glory uh, in Christ Jesus. So what am I saying? In other words, God is going to give us what we need out of his unlimited supply of resources and riches. You don't have to worry about God ever running out of gasoline or oil. You never have to worry about God running out of money or things that to be able to provide, provide for you. You don't have to worry about God running out of anything because God is unlimited in his resources. But we cannot look at just riches, church, in the manner in which the world looks at riches. God is speaking of spiritual things when he says riches. And I've always shared with you that he doesn't mind us getting fancy cars and wearing fancy clothes. He's not against that. But he wants us to put him first in all things and in all of our ways. So he's not, he's speaking of spiritual things, holy and righteous things, the things that Satan desires to keep us from. The thing that Satan desires, he keeps sending those meaningless distractions so we don't focus on the righteousness of God. To keep us from hearing it and obeying God's voice, that's Satan's job and he does it well. He'll send all kinds of distractions to keep you from hearing God's voice and responding to God's voice and obeying his word. We are the temple of God, church. You are the temple of God. You and I, we are the temple of God. God dwells within us. His DNA is branded upon us. We are spiritual family. His DNA proves that we are God's children uh, because that DNA is attached to us when we confessed our sins and accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. We became born again. We are his and he is ours. Therefore, church, he says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, my brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, unto God, which is your reasonable service, for this is your spiritual worship to God. So that means we, we are to sacrifice uh, to a living and holy God, sacrifice our bodies, our living bodies, our, our bodies, the temple where Jesus dwells, to God means that we give our members, we give the members of the body, that's our eyes, our tongue, our hands, our feet, our mind, our soul, our heart. We sacrifice that from ourselves and we give that, we donate that, we lovingly give it away to God. Why? Because that way we can build a relationship with God, we can connect with God, and it will be easier for, to, for us to obey God and live righteously and holy and do the right thing and think the right thing. So we have some work to do. That Romans 12, 1 says, Brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Some of us are not presenting anything to God but a bunch of foolery and foolishness. But Paul is saying in Romans 12, it's time for you to give up what belongs to God. And your body, which is God's temple, belongs to him. He gave it to you on loan, so now sacrifice and give it back to him so that you can be blessed. In every area of your life, God will come through for you. When you're committed to him, he is not a God that will lie. He will come through for you. So in other words, I'm saying take those eyes, ears, and feet, and heart, and spirit, and I'm telling you to surrender your body to do righteousness. Don't go into the clubs acting like the world. Don't go into the stores acting like the world. Surrender your body to do righteousness. You know right from wrong. We just have to decide that we're going to do right instead of doing wrong. And then I want you to take care of your body and align yourself with the creator. Align yourself with God. Aligning yourself with God means you're living righteous, you're doing righteous, and you're sacrificing your body members, your body parts to the true and living God, your creator. Take care of your bodies. We overeat. 
We don't exercise. We eat the wrong foods. We eat sugar. We eat everything we're not supposed to eat in abundance. But when we learn the word of God, we, God even tells us what kind of foods to eat because he created these bodies and he knows what they need. He knows what kind of herbs. He knows what we need. You are the church. Hallelujah. You are the church. Hallelujah. Not a building where you're sitting in a seat. You, my brother and sister, are the church. Christ is in you. So whatever you do, you have to represent Christ Jesus. The church is in the store. The church is in your car. The church is when you walk in your dog. The church is everywhere you go. Why? Because you, my brother, are the church. Now what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about it? How are we going to live into it? And how are we going to demonstrate it in our lives when people get on our nerves and when people lie on us and when people hurt us and when they backstab us or when they steal from us or when they do things that just simply bother us? How are we going to do this? How are we going to accomplish this? How are we going to do righteous to someone we're judging and we feel they don't deserve our righteousness? God does not judge you and me like that. So we have to be careful what we're doing as we carry the temple of God in us, within us. Many times we refer to the church building as the house of God. But in reality, God's house and his building is not in a brick and mortar building. God's house is in the heart and the actions of his people. That's the only way God, uh, people are going to know that God is real. By the way we act, by the way we talk, by the way we take care of our temples. They will never know, looking at a building, that God is real because it's just a building. But when the people of God stand up, when the body of Christ stands up and represents in spirit and in truth, in word and in song and in mindset, in eyes and ear set, then people will know there is a God. All that I've heard is true. There is a God. How do I know? Because he shows up in the people in my home. He shows up in the community. He shows up even in the brick and mortar buildings. He shows up for his people just like he said he would do. So now that you are the body of Christ and you know that the temple dwells in you, you have to be showing up. You show up. And you bless God's people even just by walking in the room. You don't even have to say a word or open up your mouth. The glory of God should come through the room because the glory of God is attached to you. And you are the temple of God. God lives within us. His spirit is within us. And he demonstrates his character to the world who is watching you and I every single, a single day desperately watching us looking for God. They're looking for God. They're thirsty for God. They don't know how to get to him. And when we don't show up to show them the way, then we're destroying their lives. We're destroying their eternity gift, salvation. Even when they can't realize they need him through us, they can see him. Do you hear me, church? Do you hear me, church? So when we live in, in unity with each other and, and the love of God is, is demonstrated through us, we demonstrate to the world that the king, the king, the king of kings and the Lord of Lord Jesus Christ is real. We are the citizens of God's kingdom, church. We are members of his household. We are created by God and we are loved by God. Do you know that you are loved? If no one else loves you, if no human being loves you, if everybody treats you like dirt, remember you have someone who loves you more than anyone down here could ever love you. His name is God and his spirit is within you and you have to connect and attach yourself to his spirit and identify Identify with his spirit that is in you. You're the temple. Why? Because God, the Bible says God dwells within us. The Holy Spirit is within us. We are the body of Christ. We are the word. We are the singers. We are the apostles. We are the prophets. We are the teachers. We are the preachers. We don't have time. 
anymore to mess around. Time is running out and there will come a time where it will be too late for us to accept him as Lord and Savior. God's church is built on the spiritual heritage given to us by the early apostles, early prophets of the Christian church. And we have to carry on the tradition from generation to generation. We have to be teaching about God. We have to be teaching our children about the love of God, the peace of God, the joy of God. We have to be teaching adults that cross our path about God. It's because of Jesus that we are a part of the kingdom of God. Had he decided that he would not come down from his deity, had he decided that he would not do a three-year ministry to show us the way and light up the kingdom of God and establish it here on earth, had he chosen not to take a beating for us, had he chosen not to carry the punishment of sin for us and sacrifice his earthly life so that we could have a spiritual life in Christ Jesus, had he chose not to come down from the cross. Church, where would we be? There's a song that says, where would I be? Where would I be without the love of God? Because of Jesus, we are a part of the kingdom of God. So now, today, you're being charged to walk like it. Walk like you are a part of the kingdom of God. Talk like it. Talk like you are a part of the kingdom of God. See beyond another brother's fault and see their need. Look like you are a part of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God has class and style. And the kingdom of God doesn't come out joking with filthy jokes and making fun of people and being a bully. The spirit of God is in you, so you have to walk like the kingdom because everywhere you go, you're bringing and entering with the kingdom right there with you. So we've got to be careful how we do this thing called life. How are you going to do it going forward, church? We are the house of God. We are the righteousness of God. We are priceless to God. We are the sons and the daughters of God. I am. I, I'm going to claim mine. I am a child of God. That's what the Bible tells me. I am born of God. Satan does not touch me. There's a protection, a hedge of protection. He'll come at me and he'll try to attack me. But the word tells me that the weapons that he forms against me shall not, will not prosper. I believe it and I receive it. I am alive with Christ, church. I am complete in Christ. I have the mind of Christ. I have the walk of Christ. I have the humility of Christ. And I'm a kingdom kid. Ephesians 2, 19, verses 19 through 22. The Message Bible says it like this in case I'm not making it plain enough for you. The Message Bible says that's plain enough, isn't it? it? It shouldn't have to be taught any deeper than that. It should be plain enough, they say. You're no longer wandering exiles. Gentiles, you're no, one, no longer wandering around in the wilderness as exiles. The kingdom of faith is now your home and your country. You're no longer strangers. You're no longer outsiders. You belong here, right here on earth. And don't let Satan tell you, you don't belong. You belong here. He loves to throw out distractions. He loves to throw out robots. He loves to knock us down and put his foot on us and hope we never get back up again. You are no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name of a Christian as anyone else. God is building a home for you and his people. And you are building a home, a place for yourself in heaven when that day comes for you to transition from earth to heaven. How are you building your home? And I don't mean the physical home, the brick and mortar home. I'm talking about your temple. God, how are you honoring God within your own body? With the vices that he gave you, hands, eyes, ears, feet, mind, heart, spirit. How are you building your home? Building your home takes bricks. Bricks come by praying and supplication. Bricks come by reading his word and intaking that word and living out that word. Bricks come by having faith and increasing your faith every single day. God is a building inside of you, a spiritual building. He's using all of us. 
Irrespective of how we got here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. You are the temple of God. You are the temple of God. It doesn't matter that you did this and that. It doesn't matter that you walked away. You can always come back. It doesn't matter. Satan wants you to stay stuck in your sins, but Jesus has already died for you to come out. Come on out of your sin. God used the apostles and the prophets to lay the foundation of the church. So the foundation has been laid. It's not going to crack. It's not going to rumble unless we're beating the hell out of the devil. We are on solid ground in Jesus Christ because we are the body of God. Now God is using you and me and he's using us to expand his kingdom here on earth. You're not here just to go to work every day, although when you get there, what are you going to do? You're going to represent Christ. You're going to be honest. You're not going to steal the work supplies. You're not going to come back late from lunch. You're not going to take long breaks. You're going to do what's right in the workplace because you are the body of Christ and people are looking for Christ and what you do and what you say if they know you are a Christian, but I can tell you they'll know how you're not a Christian if you look just like them and act just like them and talk just like them. We can see things shaping up every single day, day after day. You are a holy temple built by God. Isn't it beautiful, church? Somebody say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I am the temple of God. All of us are built into God's kingdom. You are a kingdom's kid. No matter how old you are, you belong to God. You are loved. You are adored. Adored. You are appreciated. God made us in his image. We are a temple in which God is quite at home when we're living right and doing right. God is comfortable within his temple here in you and I because we are doing what is righteous. We are doing what God told us to do. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of everything. He's the rock that holds everything together. He's the strength and the power that holds everything together. No man cometh unto the Father except through Jesus. So church, I want to encourage you this morning. You are the temple for the Lord. And I don't know what you're going through. And we can name a whole list of thousands of things that we're going through. Sickness and disease, heartache and pain and, and suffering of all kinds. Uh, sex trafficking in our nation. Uh, kidnappings in our nation. We, we, we have a lot going on down here. But I want you to remember that even those that get caught in the web of deception, Satan's web of deception. They too are the temple of the Lord. And God loves them as much as he loves you. He may not like what they're doing. But he will be the judge of what they've done. So therefore, you are no longer aliens. You are no longer strangers. You don't have to commit and cling to this world. You don't have to keep looking at filth and, 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 and things that are not of God because the world is offering it. God is so great and so loving and so kind and so merciful and so graceful. He gave us the power of choice. You get to choose who you will serve. Will it be the world or will it be God? Will it be man or will it be what? What are you going to serve? The Bible says God loves us so much that he gave us a choice because love is not demanding somebody to do something. Love is giving the person a choice to do something. God loves you. God loves you. Tell yourself God loves you. Give yourself a hug this morning and say God loves me. In spite of myself, God loves me. So God, help me get over myself and get to you so that I can walk in holiness and righteousness and that I can be that vessel that you can count on out in the marketplace, that I can be that vessel that you can count on to help someone with their bags. We're walking around in fear and the word of God says he didn't give us the spirit of fear. But fear is consuming 
the body of Christ and the power lies in us. If we are the temple of God, Jesus' power is within us. That anointing is within us. That the power that God extended to Jesus and Jesus died and extended and resurrected and sent it, and sent it to us, we have that power. We have to learn how to use it. You might be shaking in your boots, but you know how to call on the name of God and he'll stop the rumble in the boots and he'll show up for you and he'll take care of your situation. I'm a witness that God will do it. Do we have any witnesses out there this morning that God will do it, that he is no shorter than his, his word? If he said he'll do it, he's going to do it. What are you afraid of? What do you have to fear? Satan is a liar. You know it and I know it. So why buy into his lies and walk around on eggshells and fearful when the kingdom of God is dwelling inside of you? So when we lie and lie and lie and lie, we're serving Satan because he is the father of lies. Some of us can't tell the truth if we wanted to so we, because we're so accustomed to lying, deception. God can't dwell in an unclean temple. And I believe it's Psalm 51, and, and, and David says, give me a clean heart, a clean heart so that I may serve you. Search my heart, Lord. Take out anything that is not of you in the name of Jesus. Give me a clean heart so that I may serve you. I'm not asking for the riches of the world. I'm just asking you to clean me up so that I can serve you in righteousness and holiness. This is the word of God for the people of God today, church. I hope you found your place in this word somewhere. I did. A temple for the Lord. Book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. This is God's word. Believe it and receive it. There is no other way. And the choice is yours. He's such a gentleman. You've heard people say that. He's not going to force you to do anything you don't choose to do. He's not going to force you to serve him. Or not serve him. And that's the beauty of his love. You and I get to make the choice. He made it happen. Now we get to choose. Two thieves hung on the cross. One on each side of Jesus. When he was on the cross. One denied him and didn't receive him. The other said. Remember me. When you come into your kingdom Lord. Each made a choice. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. If you've heard this message and your heart is stirring and your spirit is stirring and you know you need to get back to Jesus or you know you need to get to Jesus, just ask him to come into your heart. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Tell him you're ready to live for him and trust him and walk with him and sacrifice yourself for him just as Jesus sacrificed himself for you. And if you pray that prayer, we'll welcome you into the body of Christ. If you're backslidden and you, you need to return back to Jesus, you know God's arms are always open for you. He never closes his arms like we do when we get mad at somebody, you can't hug me, you can't touch me, I don't wanna to talk to you, I'm through with you. Jesus is never through with you. You get to make the choice. You fell out, now you can fall back in. Isn't he wonderful? Let me give you a few announcements, church, and then we'll be done. We have Bible study, communication, and conversation at 11 o'clock every Sunday, right after this word and worship service. And we want to invite all of you to come. Come and get, join in the conversation. Pastor Errol is teaching the latter part of Galatians, and it is exciting. And the contributions that God is giving to each one of us to bring to the table and to the study is extraordinary. You're missing out if you're not coming to Bible study. 
There's so much more to learn than just hearing the preach word, although the preach word is important. And then we have prayer every Thursday at 3 o'clock. We're asking you to join us there too. We're asking you to like us on all of our social media outlets, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok under RevBev 1UP. We're always making one up on the devil with our comments and our concerns and our word there. And go on our webpage and look around and check it out. Those of you that would like to make an offering, uh, those of you that would like to tithe, you can go right to the webpage and click the give button and do what God has asked you to do. Rhythmoflifechurch.org On December 10th, we have our Christmas Acts of Kindness for the homeless coming up. We we're going to do it live, but we're going to stay on Zoom one more year. And we'll go live next year. So we're going to be on Zoom. The flyer is out on Facebook and other outlets, our Instagram and other social media outlets. Make sure you like us on YouTube and all of that. Please help us. Support us. We support you every week when we come out. We support you every week. We invite you to our Bible studies and our prayer gatherings. Every event we have, we invite you. And so we're looking for you to support so we can continue to do that. But it will be on Zoom this year on December 10th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We're going to have a wonderful time. We've already got our speakers lined up. We're already getting the program together. And it is going to be as great as our prayer conference was on August 27th. And those of you that were there knew that we had a wonderful time and that the Holy Spirit met us all through the Zoom meeting. So I think that's it for today. I want you to go knowing that God can and will do whatever you need him to do. We just have to move out of his way and allow him to be God. So go ahead and have a great day on purpose, an astronomical day on purpose, because it's your gift from God. And you can, because you have the choice. You are the temple of God. We love you. Rhythm of Life loves you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.